Okay, good evening, everybody. So we are starting the very first lesson as we go through the Bible story. And this is the exit, the genesis of beginnings. You know, the word genesis means beginning. So we are talking about the beginnings of beginnings. Okay. Um, so what we see, what we're going to see is that the Bible story begins with Genesis. Okay. Uh, and that is the beginning of everything that exists. And the Bible in Genesis tells both of things we know, things we know and things we don't know about regarding the beginning of the universe, the world, mankind. Now, although not everything is explicitly stated, Okay, the Bible does not tell us everything up front. But when we spend time looking and thinking and pondering, we will see that many important natural laws and principles were set in motion. And they were set in motion, particularly in this genesis of beginnings. Okay, so the origins many, many things that we will find throughout the Bible all the way to the end. They are all set in, they are all established in Genesis. So we are here to take a look at some of these very important ones. And these include the laws of the physical and natural world, as well as the laws of the wider invisible spiritual realm. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at signs okay we're going to look at the physical and natural world so that's signs and we're also going to look at the laws of the wider invisible spiritual realm that is where we talk about god and faith so we're going to look at the two together okay over the next few weeks and we are going to come to a certain sort of um, conclusion about the two of them so our exploration of the story of creation and beginnings aims to identify the existence and the reality of a number of these significant laws that are relevant and important to us. Okay, so this is going to be quite, uh, quite different sort of study. And the study of creation reveals and explains things we can understand. But it also raises questions that mankind has been grappling with for ages. So we're going to look at things that we both understand, as well as explore questions okay, that we have been think, talking about, thinking about for ages. Okay, so let's actually start now with this introduction. Okay, uh, if you look at your Bible, Genesis. So the first 11 chapters, we're going to go through quite, quite detail. Okay, and then the rest of the Bible story, we're going to look at the significant story. Okay, so in the very beginning, Genesis 1 verse 1, we see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So let me enlarge this. So I have three columns. One is the story that we're going to look at from the Bible. And then the second column, we're going to look at the message. What does the story tell us? And in the third column, we're going to look at the significance. How is the message, how is what the story tells us important? Okay, so three columns. And the very first column, the surface story, verse one, in the whole Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what message, what does the story tell us? Well, these very first words of the Bible states that there was a time when the universe came into existence. A time when the universe came into existence. The universe had a beginning. So the universe had a beginning. 
And so what is the significance? Significance is the universe first existed because of God. God created it. So we go, wow, God created it. Really, man? Really? Um, so we'll look at the story and see uh, how much sense it makes to say that God created the universe. Okay? So let's first of all look at the first name of God. And the first name of God is actually in Hebrew. That is Elohim. Okay? The first name of God in the Bible in Hebrew is Elohim. So in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now this name of God, Elohim, is a Hebrew noun, and it's plural. Plural means something like they or them, okay? And this is a normal usage in the Bible, in the Bible when referring to the one true God. The word Elohim also means gods, okay? It can be translated to mean gods, plural. Like I said, the word is plural. But when referring to God, it is one true God, not gods, okay? And in case some of us misunderstand this plurality, uh, Elohim, this plurality of Elohim, does not refer to the Trinity of God. So don't have the impression that Elohim is God's name, which means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, oh, okay? Elohim is not uh, plural for Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's simply, Elohim simply intensifies the plurality of majesty. That, that sounds like a big mouthful, huh? Intensifies the plurality of majesty. What that really means is it's called the royal, royal plural. You know, like the queen, uh, the queen of England, when she speaks about herself, she'll say, our, our royal person, our royal majesty, when she refers to herself. You see, she's one person, a woman, but yet she uses the pronoun we and us. Okay. That is called the plurality of majesty or the royal plural, we. But it actually is referring to just one person. Okay, so that's Elohim. Can be translated gods. It can also be used just for that one true God. Okay, and so what is the significance? Elohim is the first name of God revealed in the Bible. This is his name associated with creation. It does not indicate that there's, there are many gods. No, uh, not belief in multiple gods, which we call polytheism. It's not many gods because God is only one God. And Elohim simply points to the great majesty of God. Just like, you know, in a human, in human sense, when we talk about Queen Elizabeth, she says, we, referring to herself, one person. And so Elohim here points to the great majesty of God. And we can see that in Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5, 6, and 18, okay, so God says something about himself. Can somebody turn to Isaiah 45 and help us to read verse 5, verse 6, and verse 18? Isaiah 45, verse 5, 6, and 18. Verse 5, Isaiah 45. Uh, I am the Lord, and there is no other apart from me. There is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. And uh, verse 8, right? Verse 6. Oh, verse 6, okay. Uh, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, 
Man may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. And uh, verse 8, am I right? Verse 18. 18, uh, verse 18. Uh, just a minute. For this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but form it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so God says very clearly in verses 5 and 6, in fact, the beginning of verse 5 and then the ending of verse 6, he repeats himself. He repeats himself by saying, I am the Lord and there is no other. Okay? Uh, there is no other God besides him. And then in verse 18, so interestingly, he created. This is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens and then fashioned and made the earth. And it says, he says that I am the Lord and there is no other, no other God besides me. So the significance here as we start off with the creation, talking about Elohim created the heavens and the earth, the significance that God is telling us is there is only one God whom we are to worship. Yes, starting from Genesis verse 1 already, God already sets the condition. There's only one God whom we are to worship because he is the one that is the creator. There's no other God like him. So we can see that the first words of the Bible tell what man would never know if this record from God was not given to man. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it tells us the universe and we were created. Everything came into existence through creation by a creator God, who is the originator and beginning of our existence. So the point is, if God did not tell us this fact in the Bible, we will never find any history book or any book in the world. We would never know that God created us because there was no man to witness his creation. There was no scientist around to testify that uh, a God created us. So what is the significance that we can pick up from that? God must have existed outside of time, space and matter to be there to create a beginning of time. Okay? So if we draw a timeline, if we draw a timeline, there will be somewhere in the near the beginning where time starts. But before that, God already existed. Okay, before that, God already existed. And then uh, we see that this, this record actually agrees with signs that people so much depend on nowadays. And this record in the Bible is accurate. Everything came into existence with dimensions of, in the beginning, talks about time. And then God created the heavens that talk about space, heavens and the earth, and that talks about matter. So we, in science, we talk about time, space, and matter, the three dimensions that form our physical existence. Yeah, the three dimensions. So everything we know and everything we experience comes into existence at some point in time. The beginning. Things are made of matter, so that's earth, and they take up space, that's heavens. That's what we learn in science, right? And so, to come back here, you see, like I said now, God existed outside of time, space, and matter, and then he created a beginning of time. And that means he is outside of our awareness of him. It's 
can, can I use a simple little illustration that we are inside the house and God is outside the house. We are not aware of God. Yeah, outside the house means he is be existed outside of time, existed outside of space and matter that we are aware of when we are in the house. Okay, so we need a window. We need a window to look outside to know that, oh, there's God outside there. Okay, and that window is the Bible. The Bible allows us to look outside of our time, space and matter inside the house. That's my illustration. To see that outside of our existence, there's actually God. So he's outside of our awareness, outside of our knowledge, outside of our understanding and even imagination until the Bible reveals to us. And without his special revelation to us, we would not be able to know about everything before mankind and history began. Right? Because each one of us, we only live 70, 80 years. And then after that, if we are stronger, we might live to 120 and then we are gone. So we don't see what happened before in the past, but God reveals. Okay? And because no one was around to be a witness that God created the universe, we have to put our faith in him. This is a true fact. No one was around as a witness, but God revealed, God spoke to us, and God told us so that we have to put our faith in him that this is a true fact. God created. Let's take a look at Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3. Somebody turn to Hebrews 11, 1 to 3, and read for us. Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, so... Faith is being sure of what we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. And this is what the ancients, the people long, long ago in the Bible were commanded for. And verse 3, we, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So God spoke and it came into existence. So that what is seen, whatever we can see around us as our material world, was not made out of what was visible. So God spoke and all these things came into existence that we can see. We can know what happened even before man appeared on earth. You know, in the five days, five and a half days before creation, we know what happened even then because God who was there told us. And God who says he is faithful and true, Revelation 3.14 can, can be depended upon to tell us the truth. Can somebody just quickly refer to Revelation 3.14? That is actually referring to Jesus, but we know Jesus and God were at creation. The Trinity were at creation. Revelation 3, 14, please. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Thank you, Georgina. So there you go. The words of the Amen, faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. That is Jesus. Jesus and God are two out of the Trinity, okay? So God is faithful and true. Jesus is faithful and true and can be depended upon to tell us the truth. So we said that this record, this record agrees with science. We will be exploring that 
in detail in the next next uh, next two weeks besides today, okay? But what the significance is, is our world and we have a beginning and then one day there will be an end as well. So there will be a beginning and there will be an end. One curious question will be, how long will this universe last? You know, so we uh, human beings are very curious, but more importantly and relevant, God is responsible for our existence. Did he create us for some purpose? If yes, what is the purpose? Can we discover his purpose so that we so that we know what we can or should be working on or working towards while we are still alive. The Bible not only tells us about the beginning of the universe, it also indicates to us that one day, this universe as we know it will come to an end. Okay, can somebody help us to read 2 Peter 3.10? Second Peter three ten, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Okay, thank you, Mac. So. So what we see here is that the Bible tells us the heavens will disappear with a noise. Okay, so this earth will be destroyed by fire. And we know we are talking about global warming. The, the earth temperature is actually rising, climate change. This is the whole topic about, uh, the whole topic that many nations are talking about now, climate change. And we are so concerned about the, rising of the temperature on planet Earth. All right, and so the Bible actually indicates that one day, the elements, the Earth will be destroyed by fire. Everything will be laid bare. So the Bible tells us a beginning of our Earth, and the Bible also tells us the ending of our Earth. And that's the interesting thing. The Bible is also a document of God that tells us things in between, between the beginning and the ending. And so this is where we have a story, the story of God, the story starting with creation and the story of mankind and God's relationship with men. So unlike the mythical stories of ancient peoples, the Bible is specific about key details of how creation came about. If you have read or heard of myths, mythical stories, you know, the, the Greeks and the Romans, they have all their myths about gods. They are gods, Zeus, and uh, the all kinds of gods. All those gods, they meet people, and the stories are quite fantastical and quite... Uh, Shall, shall we say they are quite ridiculous because some of those stories, the gods are made, uh, men, the, the gods made men so that they can make fun of men or the, the gods made men so that they can, they can uh, do, do terrible things to men. Okay, so those are mythical stories. They are not real and somehow they, they kind of like, they like don't give us details that make sense. They, they don't give us details that are logical and sensible. But the Bible is very different. And we're going to see that in the next two, three weeks. But how the Bible is very specific, very specific with details, okay, about how things, how this world came into existence. And it makes sense, as we shall see. So the significance is if we understand the message and significance of the Genesis creation account, God is telling us there is no doubt, no doubt, creation is absolute fact and not myth. There's no evolution, 
and there's no other theory about how this world and all of us came into existence. Okay, so with the first, first very verse, verse itself, we can see God created time, space, and matter, which is consistent with what science tells us about the three dimensions of our physical world. Okay, and the significant points we can learn. God is the true creator God. He's the only God that we are to worship. Now, go on to verse 2. Would somebody like to read verse 2 for us? The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the formless and empty earth that was in darkness. Thank you. Okay, so now we start with the Spirit of God. Okay, and we see what is the message trying to tell us. God created the world using the principles of science. Science explains how God worked in creation. Okay, so now we're going to look at certain things that science talks about, okay, to compare with our Bible account of the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, evolution scientists, they propose that life came from what they call a primordial soup. Yeah, primordial, before man came into existence. There was a primordial soup or simple English, there was a water solution. Okay, there was a water solution. And you see that the Bible says God's spirit was hovering over the waters. You see the similarity? Scientists talk about the earth from the very beginning, there was water. And we see the spirit of God in the Bible was hovering over the waters. Also water. Okay, so human scientists are able to discover and explain certain scientific details on how God could have worked in creating the universe. I say could because while certain things are similar to the Bible, they are not accurate in the way that the people uh, actually uh, suggest or theor made a theory about. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So just now, as I said, there's a similarity. That science mentions a soup or water. Right? There's a soup or water. Just as the Bible does, the Bible also mentions the waters. Yeah? Now, that similarity, the difference. The difference is that evolution scientists make up the theory. And this is a theory which they try to prove, okay? But proven not correct. Proven not correct. Their theory was there was a hydrogen-rich mixture of methane. So that's gases, huh? Hydrogen-rich mixture of methane, ammonia, and water vapor atmosphere. So the atmosphere of the earth to them at the time before things came into existence, huh? uh, was this atmosphere with hydrogen, methane, ammonia, water vapor. And they, their theory is that this kind of atmosphere of gases managed to produce amino acids. Managed to produce amino acids. And amino acids are the, the first, the building blocks for living cells. Okay. Amino acids are the building blocks for living cells. You need amino acids for a cell to, to have a living cell. But recent scientists have discovered that the first form, first life form did not, did not come from a prim primitive primordial soup. So that was originally what human uh, evolution theories thought. Of course, the life, first forms of life, living cells to come into existence. But recent 
more recent years, uh, scientists have discovered this first life form did not come from a primitive primordial soup, the way they have uh, theorized. It has been proven that the atmosphere, just now we were talking atmosphere, of early Earth was far from what evolution scientists proposed. More likely, there was carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water vapor. And they say that any hydrogen, just now they said hydrogen rich, right? Mixture. But now there is discovered that hydrogen in the atmosphere would have escaped into space. So it's not possible for that kind of atmosphere without hydrogen to produce amino acids and then create living cells. So that the first part of their theory already, what we call pao, pao tang, already cannot. Then the next part of their theory, talking about amino acids, remember they're the building blocks of the living cells. Okay, now the amino acids, the building blocks of the life cell, okay, there were other complex problems such as you must have the right combination of amino acids. So to them, it's just so simple. Uh, all this atmosphere of gases will produce amino acids and amino acids after that, there will be uh, living cells. To them, it's just so simple to, to make up a theory and tell, tell us that, see, this will create a human being or cre create life. But no, you must have the correct combination of amino acids before you can get a living cell. Besides that, there are other factors that made it impossible for any life forms to evolve. All right, so therefore you see their theory that starts with a primordial soup. The Bible agrees there's a water, there's a water base in, uh, in, in the very beginning, but the rest of how living cells and living things came about we were proven wrong. Now, if you want to read the more details, you can look for this book, The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. I took some of these details from the published, published book of in 2004, page 42 onwards, huh? FF forwards. So what the message is to us is the source of energy, okay, or the source of essence, that produced life came from God's Holy Spirit. Okay, the source of energy or the source of essence that produced life came from God's Holy Spirit. Life on earth came from God's Holy Spirit who hovered over the waters and created life somewhat like a brooding mother hen that produced chickens. Okay. The original Hebrew word for hover, hovering over the waters, okay, the original Hebrew word for hovering over waters is the picture of the mother hen, brooding mother hen, hovering in order to produce. All right, so, so between the Bible and what evolution scientists say, the evolution theories, uh, they they make use of certain scientific truths, but the facts were that um, the conditions were not right. The elements did not exist as they thought existed in the very beginning. So their theory of evolution about all this, in all these steps, all went haywire. Okay, so what can we learn? we can learn that there is a natural physical reality from this verse. And there is also a spiritual reality that exists. So there are two realities, physical reality, a spiritual reality. The physical reality is where we say that God was, the spirit of God was hovering over the water. Okay, so let me highlight the natural physical reality as telling us that the, there were the waters. The natural physical reality. 
and there's a spiritual reality comes to us in the person of the Spirit of God. I use a purple underline to refer to the spiritual reality. So we have two realities, physical and spiritual existing because the Bible tells us God is spirit. John 4.24, um, somebody who can find the Bible very fast, can you please flip there and just... Read for us, John 4.24. Okay, God is spirit. Okay, I read uh, John 4 24. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Thank you. Okay, God is spirit and worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you see that there's a spiritual reality in the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then we live in a visible and tangible reality that exists along with an invisible spiritual reality. So they are overlapping. They exist together at the same time. Just that our tangible world is visible, but the world of God, the spiritual world is invisible. That is a big difference. So I will use the brown once again for the physical reality which is visible and then there is also the spiritual reality the purple I will use and underline for the spiritual reality and then just now we were talking about human scientists trying to discover and explain through science how God could have worked God could have worked. So they were right. God started with the element of water, which they call a primordial soup, but their steps were not accurate. So the significance is non-living matter cannot evolve to produce life. Okay, their steps, they were talking about all these gases, this kind of atmosphere that uh, that will come to, to create amino acids, okay? And then the amino acids will create first living life cells. So, sorry, the gases in themselves were not correct and they did not, non-living matter did not evolve to produce life. Because non-living matter has no energy or life essence to produce life. There must be a source of energy or life for something or someone to produce life. And this is consistent science from day one. See, science never change. From day one, this is true. You need a life form to produce a life form. A non-living life form cannot produce a living thing. Yeah? A non-living thing cannot produce a living thing. That is science from day one. So this life that does produce life comes from the spirit of God who was hovering over the waters like a mother hen. I said the Hebrew word hovering over the waters is like a picture of a mother hen, right? To produce the energy or life essence needed to produce life. Okay, so Man, in all his ability to create things, now we are very good with technology, we can create a lot of things, but man still does not have the power or ability to produce life from non-living matter. Now what we read from uh, Hebrews, what came into existence was not, uh, was not what came from what could be seen. What came into existence was not what could be seen. God spoke. Right? And with his power, he was able to produce life. Okay, But man cannot produce life from non-living matter without a source of energy or life to initiate that life spark. So somebody, you know, um, so some, some people are quite far thinking. They think, okay, here's a thought. 
if God used science to create the universe and us, all right, our knowledge and understanding of life compared to God is really minuscule, really, really tiny, just like one little grain of sand compared with, let's say, a whole planet Earth, right? Our knowledge and understanding of science is just that like one little speck of sand compared to the whole planet of Earth. Our knowledge is really minuscule compared to God's ability. Will it ever be possible for men to learn science to God's degree and thus be like God himself to be able to create? Will it ever come to that? So that's a, that's a thing that some, some people may talk about, you know, some people who believe in science. So there's those people who are science fanatics. Now, here's a thought to answer that question or that, that thought. Huh? It may take never or an eternity for man to ever catch up with God's grasp of science. Okay. Oh, sorry. With his small h, with man's grasp of science, with God's knowledge and wisdom of science. Okay? Because it's a, if God created, use science to create that. And we also learn science to that degree of God's of knowledge and wisdom of science. You see, it's, it may take never or an eternity for man to ever catch up because God created a whole universe and complex human being in just six days. Imagine just six days, God can create a whole universe and complex human beings. How can ever, how can man ever catch up with that? Right? How can man ever catch up with that? However, there's one more important thing that, that makes this not even necessary or relevant. Okay, this, this thought that we are answering and thinking about. The Bible story as a whole indicates that man will never be able to advance in science to the degree of God's knowledge of power. This is because God's destiny for man is to be eternal spiritual beings. And God's destiny for man is not remain as physical men. Remember just now we read that there comes a day when the whole, when the whole planet Earth will be burnt in the fires. Burned in fire. And we are already experiencing the, the global warming. We are already at the stage of global warming and our, our science has reached nowhere near God's. So there's no possibility that we'll ever catch up with God, uh, considering that God's destiny for man is to be eternal spiritual beings. And then we will see by the end of human history and the story in Revelation, the last book of our Bible, okay? Uh, when the universe, our world, and human history as we know them will come to an end, and man will transit into a eternal spiritual realm and existence. See, God created us because man is, man is not meant to exist and live as a human, physical being indefinitely. God's plan for man is to transit into a spiritual realm and eternity. Okay, so we have the creation of life not as um, evolution scientists proposed from the work of the Holy Spirit of God who has life and is able to produce life. Theories of evolution scientists, non-living things cannot produce life. Simple science. Okay, so let's come on to the actual story of creation in verses 3 to 28, we read that God created the natural world and man in six days. Okay, now let's look. Day one, we have God created light. Day two, God created the sky. Day three, God created the land and the seas and then vegetation. And when we talk about vegetation, you see he says, seed bearing plants and trees that bear fruit with seed according to their own kinds. Okay, so uh, seed 
bear fruit and seed according to their own kinds. That's very important. So this is the signs from day one of God's creation. Yeah, Plants and trees were created by God to bear fruit and seed that will produce their own species of plants and trees. From day three, uh, from day three. Then in day four, God created the lights in the sky and that would include the sun and moon with stars to mark the seasons, the days and the years to give lights to earth and to govern day and night. We will talk about this in great detail later on. Okay, and it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting um, topic actually because of certain question. Day five, you have water creatures and birds. So uh, animals in the water, and then you have the birds. And once again, you see, according to their kinds. So vegetation of plants and fruits produce their own kinds. Water creatures and bird, birds, sorry, produce according to their kinds. Then day six, land animals according to their kinds. So you see, the signs is all there in the Bible. That is from chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. Okay. And then we see on day six, God also created men, male and female. And man, male and female, was made in God's likeness or image to be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it. That means rule over the fish of the sea, birds and land animals in verses 26 to 28. Verses 26 and 28, we will talk about it in more detail next week. Okay, but for now, let's look at this creation, the, the creation of these six days. Okay, the message. What message can we pick up from, the, from this surface story? Now, just now we talk about evolution scientists and scientists in general. Despite the problems with how the first living cells came about in their theories of evolution, right? There were problems, but the order that life appeared on Earth, as scientists proposed, actually agrees with the Bible. So you see, just now I said how God works, scientists and science can work it out in that sense, how God works in this in the form of a in certain ways, but in the actual details about the, the microscopic details of how God produced, uh, that one sign, human beings cannot, cannot discover from science. Human beings don't have that ability. So what we see is God first created water. Just now we saw, right, um, Spirit 2, there was water. And then God first created water in the beginning. And then day one, he created light. Now from there, God went on to create the sky, day two. Then land and sea as the spaces for all life to thrive in. Just now, I, I compared our Bible creation account with the myths. Yeah, you remember I talked about the myths just now? Okay, so the myths, they don't give details and they don't make sense. Yeah, they don't give Detailed information like what we are seeing in the Bible, light, sky, land, seas, then vegetation with uh, seed of their own kinds, fruit of their own kind, and then the lights, and then the water creatures, the birds, the land, animals, and then human beings, right? The myths don't make sense in these details, but you can see the Bible, how detailed the Bible is, and let's explore this detail that we are given. All right, so day two, the sky, day three, land and sea, because you see, life on earth needs space. Life on earth needs space, whether the vegetation or the animals or human beings, they need space. So after the sky, land and sea are created for that space, then followed by life needs sustenance, need food, so God creates vegetation in day three. And vegetation, the plants, the fruits, the trees, all those, they are the base level in the food chain or food web for all life. Isn't that what we learn in science? You see, it's 
we, we just read all these details, but we don't think about the, we don't think about at the bottom, what does it really mean to us? Okay, so at the bottom of creation, this is what it really means. When God created vegetation, it's actually providing the, you know, that, that food chain or the food web, the very first level of food producers, base level, oh, I just remember, of food producers. I was thinking and thinking of what is the correct term. After God made vegetation, he made the sun to enable photosynthesis for plant life to grow, thrive, and be able to sustain animal life. Okay, how marvelous. And then you know the creation of God at night, the, the plant, okay? uh, sorry, when, when, when uh, this, this plant made, made food with photosynthesis, the plant actually produced oxygen. Oxygen for mankind to breathe. See, so marvelous creation of God. God made the sun on day four. God made the lights of the sun and moon for earth, not just for the plant so the photosynthesis, also the sun, the sun to govern the cycles of life via seasons. Okay, so with the sun, there are the seasons of days, there's the season of years, and there's day and night, day four. These lights and seasons impact the life cycles of vegetation and animals in order to meet their survival needs, whether for food or for creation, propagation, yeah, producing the next generation of their kind. Animal life began in the water with the sea creatures, day five, then you have the birds also day five, and then you have other land creatures day six, and finally, men. So you see the order of creation fits with scientific exploration and reconstruction of how life began on Earth. So in general, science was correct or scientists were correct to say this, uh, you start with water, you go on with light, and then you go on with, with uh, life in the water and then life on land, and then finally human beings. The order of scientists and what they understand about life is actually accurate, consistent with the Bible. There is no conflict between science and the Bible. That means no conflict between faith or science and faith in a creator God or the Christian faith, okay? The Christian faith. I should not say religion, huh? I should say Christian faith because not all religion is accurate. So God created the natural world using the principles of science. Okay, so what is the significance that we have just seen in all these things about the six days of creation? First of all, as we have concluded, no conflict between science and faith in God. Bible agrees that the Bible on, uh, sorry, science agrees with the Bible on the order of creation, okay? Then water and light are needed for life to thrive. You notice the first two elements, water, just now in verse two, we talk about water, and then day one, God created light. Water and light are needed for life to thrive. Plant life needs water and light. Animals also need water and light to maintain life and activities. The expanse of sky, land, and sea provide all living things the space and environment to survive, to propagate, and to thrive. Okay? So the order of how God created everything actually makes a lot of sense. Through science, God enables men to discover and learn how things develop at work, okay? Science shows us how we can get things done in the natural world that God created so that we can harness the principles of science to do things with the intelligence that God has given mankind. What about the sun, moon, and stars? They were created to sustain a global ecosystem that enables men to have variety 
and variation of the seasons on earth so that man can discover and experience all kinds of wonders and experiences on earth as he filled the earth, as he meaning man. You know, just now we said that God produced, uh, God created man and co caused him to be fruitful, right? So now for man to be fruitful, he filled the earth and fulfilled his commission from God. God gave man a commission. So we see from the very beginning of creation, God set in motion science and its principles. Okay, from the very beginning of creation, just now I said, nah, with creation comes a lot of things we may not see. We may not really seriously think about it, but actually God has set in motion all these invisible laws and principles. He created the order that makes the various natural systems of the earth and life function ecologically as we know it. That means how the plants and the animals, how they grow more, and then this, the animals will eat the plants, and then how later on the animals will be eaten by other animals, and so on, and so on, okay? So how the life function ecologically. Now, science can make and explain how things work but it cannot explain or prove the questions of life. So I just give you a thought on this. We will talk about it more in the next two weeks. For the intangible and spiritual matters and questions of life, we need to put God into the picture. And we put God into the picture to complete. Need to put God into the picture to complete life and existence. Issues of life and existence. We will talk about this. Okay? Now we're just opening up the can to explore that there are issues and there are important things to think about. Okay, the last part is the creation of men. So God created everything else, right, in the first five and a half days. I say five and a half days because the first part, it says God created the land animals. Then the second part of day six, God created man. And here is where man was created different. God created man different from all other living things. Why and how? God created man very unique from other animals in two create critical ways. In God's likeness. Okay, and then next one is man was given a specific commission that no other living thing was given. You see in verses 26 and 28. Okay, maybe somebody can help us to read verses 26 and 28. Chapter 1. Then God said, uh, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28 also. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Okay, so verse 26, God, God spoke about his intention, right? And then verse 27 is the creation of man as he as intended. And then verse 28 is the specific commission that he gave to men. Okay, we will talk about uh, those later, but let's come to something that we have looked at earlier on. Genesis says that the first element God made was water. Just now remember verse 2? This was followed by light. So chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, the earth was formless and empty. 
Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So God made the first element water and God said, let there be light. That's verse three and there was light. So the first two, God made the two most important elements first before he created everything else, water and light. These two elements are critical to life on earth. Just now we have already said that. All life depends on water and light. Somehow it will need water and light. Note that God uses water and light also as comparison analogies to the highlight the significant truth about Jesus. So it's no accident that God talks about water and light in creation as the first two important things he created because these have very important connection to Jesus. John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So you have Jesus' light of the world and light of life. We know the importance of light to enable us to see and live. Light also gives us nutrients. We need sunlight, vitamin D, for our skin, for our health. They are in such important to the health and working of our bodies. Okay, so that is light. Jesus is the light of the world. He provides the light, the ability to see how to live and proceed in this complicated world of endless and confusing things, issues, circumstances, and ways. Isn't that true? Right? This world is so complicated, but Jesus provides the light for us to see how to live and how to proceed. He's the light of life. Yeah? So he is the light of life. He alone is the one who shows the safe, the safe and correct way for life to be lived to the intention and purpose that God created us for. Okay, so Jesus is the only one, all right, that can give us that correct and safe way to live life, is the light of life. Now on to John 4, 13 and 14. Jesus also talks about water. Everyone who drinks this water to, will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. By this water is meant the Holy Spirit. Christ is the source of life coming from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we know from signs, once again, we talk about signs, okay? So you can see I'm making signs a very big thing, uh, and science is really very important, but it is not different, or it, you cannot divorce science from God, actually. We'll talk about it later. So we know from science that physical water and light are crucial to life on earth, so Jesus, when he calls himself the light of the world, the light of life, and the source of water that sustains life spiritually, okay? Spiritually, just like water is physical water sustains life. So water spiritually tells us how important Jesus is to us, right? Calling himself light and water tells us how important he is to us. Physically, we cannot do without water and light on this planet. Spiritually, we also cannot do without water and light, not just for this planet, but for the eternal life to come. So now we talk about the duality. Duality means the two. Duality, physical and spiritual. Water and light make up the whole of our existence, physical and spiritual. We need both. We need both the physical and the spiritual elements to sustain our existence. 
In a later lesson, we will talk about the balance of the physical and spiritual elements. Now, what we do see is they are very important to us. Okay, so now here's some interesting questions that you may have that people talk about. So here's a question that says, isn't day and night determined by the sun? No, so somebody will ask, why was that day and night on the first three days, even before the sun and moon were created on the fourth day? So if the sun is the one that decides day and night, then how come the sun was created on the fourth day? It doesn't make sense. That's what people say. Okay, so let's take a look. Note that the first thing God created in the universe was light. Remember day one? It was this light shining on earth in space that determined day and night for our planet before the sun was created. Okay, so we actually, before there was sun, there was already light. Don't believe me? Let's revise Genesis 1 verses 3 to 5. Okay, can somebody unmute and read for us? Genesis 1, 3 to 5. Genesis chapter 1, 3 to 5. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning. The first day. Thank you. Okay, so from the very first day, he created light. And he separated light from the darkness. So can you imagine light is one side, darkness is one side. Okay, so after he created light, God separated light from darkness. Light was shining from one direction and darkness was in the opposite direction or space that light did not illuminate, that the light did not reach. So we know that the earth is a sphere. The earth is ball shaped. Okay, the earth is shaped like a ball. Now, what happens from here? And then we see that, uh, let me stop share and let me then now, okay, uh, can everybody see me with this ball? Everybody see you with this ball? Is it too big? Maybe a smaller one. Okay, which one you prefer, the bigger one or the smaller one? The, the big one. one. The big one, okay, the big one is easy to see. How can I, wait, uh, uh, speaker, A. Eh? Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Can you see me? Am I there? Yes. Yes, with a green ball. Okay, good. Because I can't see, I only see Jacqueline because I think Jacqueline was the last speaker. So, okay, I can't see myself. So you will have to help me if you can't see anything clearly. Yeah? Okay, so what happens is the earth spins on its own axis, okay? So imagine I don't actually have a satay stick, but okay, let's pretend this one. Okay, so the earth spins on its own axis. Do you know what, what that means? That means by itself, let's imagine a satay stick huh? pierced. Can you see my pencil? Ah, good, okay. Now you all keep quiet for a while. Ah, thank you for spotlighting my video. Thank you, Jason. So this is my pencil. Imagine it's like a satay stick. It pierced through the whole ball. Okay, it pierced through the whole ball. Imagine the satay stick. Then the earth spins round and round with the satay stick. So the earth is spinning on its own axis. Can you understand so far? Okay, this is what it means to say the earth spins on its own axis. So by itself, planet earth is already spinning. Okay, and then you see that before there was sun or moon, day and night were initially based on, remember God created the light, so let's say God created the light and the light was separated from the darkness. So this is light on this side and then darkness is on this side. Okay, so if this side is light, what happens is the light shines on the planet Earth and the planet Earth is spinning. Can you see? What does this, what does this part of planet Earth experience? If this is light, what does this part of planet Earth experience? They come. They come. Daytime, right? Okay, what about this side? Night. This is night. So there you go. Even from day one, God separated the light 
from the darkness here, okay, the darkness here, and so the earth itself can have day and night already. Make sense? Scientific, right? Okay, so there you have light, the earth spins, and it can have day and night already. So that is the first thing we can see, okay? Uh, the side of the earth that face the light is day, and then on the other side, this is night. And so in this way, day and night is possible as 24 hour periods because the sun spin, uh, the earth spins on its own axis. So for the first three days, earth and night, day and night were determined by the earth facing this light here, that's the day, and then this side is the night. Okay, now on the fourth day, on the fourth day, the sun and moon were made as signs and markers of seasons. Okay, so now this is, uh, now I have to change. Planet Earth is smaller than the sun, right? Okay, planet Earth is smaller than the sun. So what happens is the planet, let me see, I try to move it back. Okay, so here you go, this is the sun. Uh, normally the, the rotation will go this way, right? But for you to see it more clearly, maybe what I'll do is I'll rotate it this way. I'll rotate it this way, okay? Rotate this, uh, never mind, uh, actually, this way is still okay. So this way, now you see, it's only on day four that the sun was created, correct? No? And the Bible tells us the sun and the moon. So let's focus on the sun first. Uh, the sun is more important. We focus on the sun, not, not the moon. Sun and moon were made as signs and markers of seasons, days, and years to separate day and night. So what this means is just now, uh, without the sun, okay, without the sun, let's say this is planet Earth, without the sun, what happened was the day, the, the planet Earth just rotates and rotates and rotates, right? Agree? It just rotates and rotates and rotates. So there is day, there is night. But if you look at it very carefully, there's no difference between one day and one night from the next day and the next night. You understand what I'm saying? There's no difference. One day and one night is still exactly the same as the last day, the last night, and many nights ago. So when God created the sun, now this is the sun, and this is planet Earth, it goes around. Correct, no? So don't forget, no? planet Earth is still spinning by itself, huh? spinning on its own axis. So the side that spins and faces the sun is day. The side that is away from the sun is night. So what happens is the planet Earth will go around the sun. How many, how long does it take for the planet Earth to go around the sun? One year. Very good. How many days is that? 365. 365 and a quarter. And quarter. Correct. Correct, not? The Earth takes 365 and a quarter days to go around the, the, the sun. And this is where the, as it rotate, as it spins on its own axis, don't forget, nah, it's spinning in two ways. Nah. The earth itself is continuously spinning day and night, spinning day and night, huh? okay? But at the same time of spinning day and night is also going around the sun. And this going around the sun is where the, the earth will experience spring, summer, autumn, winter. Just If just by itself, it goes round and round without the sun, there's no spring, autumn, summer, winter. You're following what I'm saying? Just going round and round by itself, there's no spring, summer, autumn, winter. It just one day and one night is exactly the same like every day, every night. But now with the sun going around, the earth going around the sun, this makes it possible to have spring, summer, autumn, winter. And that is where we say that the planet Earth is now a marker for seasons and mark days and nights and years. Are we okay? Interesting, right? Okay, so the Bible is actually not wrong. The Bible is actually not wrong in what it says about the sun, moon, and so on. So this, let me finish, I just over, overshot by a minute and just bear with me for a little while. Huh? So sun and moon were made as signs and markers of seasons, days, years to separate day and night. 
before the sun and moon were created. Day and night don't have markers. It's just one day after one night and it's endless. Every day, every night is the same as every day, every night. But now that the sun exists with the moon, it causes, it causes for planet Earth, it causes seasons, tides, and so on. It causes seasons and tides. And these seasons and tides help to distinguish the days and years as a way for men to mark and count time. When it goes one round around, one revolution around the sun, it is one year. That counts time. Just now, no sun, it will, have not, it will not have a year. You see? So as the earth spins on its own axis, that is where you get day and night, 24 hours, 360 degree rotation around uh, by itself as well as around the sun. At the same time, like I said, earth, it revolves around the sun. One complete revelation, revolution around the sun is one year, and then it will experience seasons. Certain parts of the sun, of the planet Earth, longer day and longer night and so on, depending on the, the time, the season, the time of the year, okay? And then the presence of the moon with the gravitational pull of both sun and moon will cause tides on the Earth to rise and fall, and this will impact on animal life and propagation. So we all know, we know all this from our study of science. God created the science behind how the sun, moon, stars, and earth work and relate to each other so that we can optimize our understanding of all these seasons, times, tides, and resources that were created for us to use as we live on earth to work, to play, and to rest, and we live our lives and fulfill our earthly purpose. See how much sense the Bible makes and how scientifically sensible it all is. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your, your truth is really so amazing. It's just that we need to spend time thinking about it, realizing that what you have created is not something that can be disproved by science, because science is created by you as your instrument for our good. That's what you said, that every day, everything you created was good. And it was good, it is good because it has a very specific benefit for us. We thank you for your love and we thank you for your such amazing goodness. Lord, we just cannot express how majestic Elohim you are, how great and how amazing you are as the creator God. We give you thanks that you are a God who loves us as you create and prepare things for us. And so we pray, Lord, that you continue to work on our faith and our understanding and a deeper appreciation of our life purpose and life commission so that we may live our life truly purposefully. We pray and give you thanks for all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.